Top of the morning, Sonoma County. To all the lovely men and ladies out there, a hearty and healthy Irish hello. You're listening to the Celtic Coach Radio Show, where science, spirituality, and self-discovery meet. And boy, self-discovery, science, and creativity are going to, uh, well, we're going to take a dance today. We, uh, we've we got a, a, a lovely gentleman in the house today by the name of Dr. Gay Hendricks. He's a, uh, a leader in the field of relationship transformation. He's been doing this for a long time, uh, over 40 years, 45 years, in fact, after earning his PhD in counseling psychology from Stanford. Gay served as professor of counseling psychology at the University of Colorado for 21 years. He's also written over 40 books. Uh, bestseller, of course, was Five Wishes, The Big Leap, which I loved and also Conscious Loving and New Conscious Loving Ever After. We're going to be talking to Gay today. He's co-authored over, uh, how many books have we got here? A lot of books <laughs> uh, with his uh, with his darling wife, uh, Dr. Caitlin Hendricks, some of which have been used as primary text in universities around the world. Gay also co-founded the Spiritual Cinema Circle, which distributes inspirational movies and conscious entertainment to subscribers in over 70-plus countries. We're going to be talking today to Gay about his new book, The Joy of Genius. And the topic of our show today on the on the on the uh, on the show today is connecting and expressing your genius. So, without further ado, please put your virtual hands together in uh, in a warm welcome and uh, Dr. Gay Hendricks. Hello, Gay. Hello, Dermot. Great to be talking with you again. Uh, and, and you too, Gay. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to chat to us. I sent out the newsletter and a lot of people emailed me and were very excited for you to come back on the show. Now, are you hearing me loud and clear, Gay? Uh, yes, I am. Okay. And the same is true for you. You're coming in loud and clear on the phone. I was uh, I was talking to a mate of mine, Gay, um, uh, Michael, a friend of mine, and he was uh, he was telling me, you know, we were we were talking about uh, we were talking about the fires, you know, because up there by you too, you probably got quite a bit of smoke going on. Well, yes, the smoke hasn't quite gotten to us yet, but mm. um, we're probably about forty miles away from the fires. But uh, it's very worrisome because just a year ago, we had our big fire here in Ohio, where I live, and uh, the fires came within a couple of miles of our home, so it's uh, it makes you nervous. Yeah, well, you know, that's what I wanted to put a little spotlight on, because in, in the book we're going to be talking, of course, is your new book, The Joy of Genius, um, The Next Step Beyond the Big Leap. And uh, I was talking to my friend Michael, and, you know, he was a little bit worried about the fires and the whole lot, and, and I was talking to him, and I said, Michael, you know, I'm, I'm interviewing Gay Hendricks today on the show, and one of the things that he has in his book that really struck me was he was talking about the fires, you know, that we had up there, and he was saying in the book that the fire came within a mile of his house and he happened to be uh flying i think back from singapore uh on an airplane him and his wife and so they got the news and it wasn't looking good and you you share the book gay that you sat down with your wife and you were talking about the house and you took out some champagne you toasted all the great times in the house and you toasted the house and your book collection and and everything you know that you had in the house because uh, you were talking about, you know, you don't need a creative zone to be creativity. And then you blessed the house and you guys both went off to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, my question there, Gay, is what allowed you to be able to do that? Yes, well, one of the things I talk about in The Joy of Genius is how to let go of control of things that you don't have any control over. So my wife and I were in Singapore. We were <laughs> we were in a hotel and we were uh, due to come back to uh, the U.S. the next day. And so we flipped on the television set to see the news. We'd been up in Bangkok, and we just got to uh, Singapore. And so we flipped on the television set to CNN to see the news. And there we saw our little town of 10,000 <laughs> people, which never makes the news. There we are on the international news uh, talking about the fire. And so we uh, we got in touch with uh, – our cat sitter, Alessandra, who was uh, cat sitting our two girls, uh, uh, Greta and Allie, our two five year old British short hair cats. And um, we talked to her, and she said, Well, we're, they were going to have to uh, evacuate. And so she was getting the two girls together 
and putting them in their little traveling uh, containers. And then she was going to get our computers, and then she was going to go down to the beach and um, down to a house down there. And so when we talked on the plane, we were on the plane coming back, and it's a 14-hour flight. And so there was absolutely nothing we could do about it. Mm. And so both of us sat there and said, okay, well, we could worry about it, but what's that going to do? We don't have any control over it. So let's just talk about the great times we had there and celebrate what we had. And if we get there and it's still there, great. And if not, well, that's the next adventure. And so we, we drank a bottle of, or not a bottle, but just a, a glass of champagne and then uh, tooled off to sleep. And when we got home, we, we found that the threat was over and we were able actually to drive up to our home that night. And it was smoky, but uh, we were able to spend the night there. Fortunately, we had just installed the year before a kind of a hospital grade um, air filtration system for the house, mm. and so we were be able, were able to stay in the house uh, no problem. So, but uh, it, it's the thing about letting go of control of things that you don't have any control of anyway, and it's um, it's one of the easiest things to do, but it's one of the hardest things to remember to do. Yeah. Now, 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 what I heard in that day was that you. Uh, you talk about this in the book, and, and it struck me as something, you know, quite profound, simple, but yet maybe not simple starting off. That you talk about getting clear, like the the two folders, the red and the uh, and the green folder, and you talk about asking yourself the question, you know, what is it I can control here, and what is it I cannot control? And you said that most of our thinking, you know, our obsessing the uh, the monkey mind. Uh, goes on what we can't control. That's right. Talk and it's a little driven, bit about that. Driven by fear. Yeah. So if you think about what you what you think about, uh, a lot of the times we're thinking about the past, which is completely outside our control, and a good bit of the other time we're fantasizing worry fantasies about the future. Again, we don't have any control over the future, and so. You know, there's a lot of conversation now about being in the now and being in the present and that kind of thing. Um, and what I'm talking about in The Joy of Genius is actually the tool w that allows you to do that. And because unless you know how to get free of those things that, that you don't have any control over, you're bound to just keep running those same scripts over and over again in your mind. And so what I do in the book is I give you a very precise technology for just how to go about unplugging the energy from those things in your mind, like worrying about the past and worrying about the future. Mm. Why, why, okay, why do you think we spend more time worrying about the past and the future instead of just you know, putting the focus on, on what's going on right now? Like, is that a habit thing? Is it a, you know, what is, is it a human thing? <laughs> Uh, well, it's it's a habit, and it's a human thing. And uh, well, we'll also think about this: that when you're tied up in fear, you're trying to control things that are not yours to control. Mm. You feel like you're doing something. Your body mm. feels very engaged, but it's engaged in a futile activity. Yeah. And so, what needs to happen is to unplug from the futile activities and put your attention on what you can actually do right this moment. And there's always positive actions you can take in this moment. Like, for example, a lot of people, Dermot, consume themselves with worrying about what other people think about them. Yes. And again, that's nothing that you have any control over whatsoever, because you could stand there all of the day and try to make somebody like you, and it wouldn't work unless they genuinely had that experience. So, But what you can do is take positive actions in the present that might might cause someone to like you better. And so, for example, you could say something positive to that person, or you could um, try some other thing that, uh, that you found out that person enjoyed. But the actual act of trying to control the other person is what really ties up our energy and, is, and makes us no fun to be around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 and I related to that, Gay, you know, because... Um, I think around I, I moved from Colorado to to L.A. And L.A. for me was one of those places that you either grow or you go. And I, I decided I was going to grow in L.A. 
And so at, at age 30, my, my, my life came knocking on the door, you know, and said, okay, Dermot, you need, there's quite a few things, Dermot, you need to stop doing because they're not going to work if you want to actually have a happy life. And, and I got into Al-Anon, you know, which is children of alcoholics. And I was in that program for about 10 years. And you talk about uh, one of your friends from AA, from Alcoholics Anonymous, that that he had this epiphany, this this major insight when he realized, when he stood up and said, "Hey, I'm an alcoholic, and I've got no control. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I'm paraphrasing, but I don't know how to stop drinking. I've got no control over it." And and in the book, you talk about our um our our struggle with negative thinking ends when we declare we have no control over it could you could you talk a little bit about that gate because i found that quite interesting yes thank you for singling that out because it's actually one of the most important distinctions that mm. you could ever possibly make well think about what um my friend um jim uh, who's telling me the uh, alcoholics anonymous story Think about what that actually does. When he stood up in front of that room for the first time and said, Hi, my name is Jim and I'm an alcoholic. Well, he's actually calling it the way it is. Because up until that day, if somebody said, Jim, you're an alcoholic, he would have said, No, I'm not. I, you know, I like to drink and everything like that. But, uh, you know, he, he would have argued with it. He would have gotten defensive about it. And it's, so true that a lot of times when somebody tries to bring a piece of information to us, we get defensive about it and don't don't let it in. So anyway, um, for many, many years, he had actually resisted the idea of just calling it the way it was, uh, saying that he's an alcoholic. And there was a tremendous amount of relief that he said he experienced when he made that statement. He felt a kind of a Ah, inside, like mm-hmm. he was able to drop all of the mm-hmm. pretend, was able to drop all of the uh, defensiveness and just say, okay, yeah, that's the way that is. And that's the beginning of change. And I say the same thing about our negative thinking, because if you try to control your negative thinking, it's kind of like a dog chasing its own tail around, because you're you're trying to control negative thinking with some negative thoughts about negative thinking. And so you go around and around in a circle. What has to happen is a clear, honest moment of sobriety, real mental and emotional sobriety, where you say, okay, I don't have any control over that. It just happens. And the moment I let go of trying to control it all the time, it comes up in a whole different way then. You begin to see it as a different thing than what it what you did before. And so I in a way you you need to in the book I tell people that it probably will take you about an hour. Like in my office here, it usually takes me forty five minutes to an hour to work through the issues that I take people through in the book. So I want people to, uh, I, I tell people that I wrote the book so that you could read it and put it to use on an airplane flight between L.A. and San Francisco or between New York and Washington, D.C. or between Chicago and St. Louis. In other words, about a one-hour commuter flight. So I want people to devote themselves, body, mind, and soul, to learning the material in the book and I promise you, you can get the goodies out of it in no more than an hour. Yeah, I, I, and I, I'll reconfirm that, Gay, because uh, it, it it took. I mean, I, I like to take notes. I, I like to write notes. So uh, you know, it took a few hours, but but you could you could read it and do a few of the hands-on activities in in in, a, in an hour and a half, no question about it. You know, I'll tell you what I find I find fascinating too, Gay, about that statement that you know the struggle ends when we declare that we don't have any control over that. I mean, you could be talking about anything, not just thinking. You could be talking about alcohol, drugs, uh, uh, sex, whatever it is. Because isn't it isn't it the the kind of the resistance of, oh, I, I got this, you know, I can handle this, that keeps the whole thing going until you you say, hey, I don't I don't have this. Yeah, I think in in a lot of. If you look back through the world's literature, you would find so many instances of that problem. It basically, it's a problem of pride, of false pride, thinking, yeah, I've got this handled. Mm-hmm. I don't need any outside input. Yeah. 
And, you know, like if you look back through the world's drama and the world's comedies, really a tragedy in the theater happens when a person doesn't get the message until it's too late. And and then that has tragic consequences. A comedy, a person gets the message before it's too late and wakes up and transcends the issue that they happen to be stuck on. One of my favorite movies, I don't know if you ever saw the movie Tootsie. With, oh, yes, um, yes, Dustin absolutely. Hoffman. Yeah. Well, you know, that's a great comedy because here's a guy who is completely oblivious <laughs> yeah. to how men treat women yeah. until he has to pretend to be a woman for right. a while, and then he suddenly wakes up to this, and it's a genius movie because it, then suddenly he wakes up to see how women are actually treated and what they have to do to deal with men, and it's a whole profound life change for him. So, uh, it, But in a way, every single one of us has that same issue because every single one of us has issues that we get defensive about in our relationships or issues that we get defensive about in our own personal growth. And so part of the joy and the sometimes maddening joy of waking up in life is that you have to confront these things in yourself that you were defensive about and then suddenly ah, go ahead and accept them and let the information in. Yeah, there's, there's. Uh, I like that though. You talk about in the book uh, uh, the joy of genius. You talk about uh, love and accept your negative thoughts. It's like there's, there's just there's no way to, because I look in my own life uh, and I see how I tried to change. You know, think positive, think positively until I looked in the mirror and it was like. <laughs> <laughs> my negative my negative persona or thoughts are, are staring me back in the face. So we can't we can't change our thoughts. We can't fight with them. So so what's left to accept them? Yes, well well what most people do is go to war against their own negative thoughts, of course, and that's the dog chasing its tail around problem. The only solution really is to open your heart to yourself and love yourself for who you are and what you are and what you do. The moment you open up and embrace yourself wholly and love yourself unconditionally and accept yourself without reservation, then a whole new world opens up because now you're not in conflict with yourself. You're not in a boxing match with your own mind all the time. And things are unified inside yourself in a context of love. And particularly in relationship, you know, my wife and I have taught seminars for many, many years in the area of relationship, especially since our book Conscious Loving came out 25 years ago. I think my wife's been around the world something like 25 times since then, and she travels a little more than I did, but I've probably been around the world 20 times at least teaching relationship seminars. And wherever I go in the world, everybody is dealing with exactly the same kinds of mm -hmm. issues. In relationship, there are People struggle oftentimes because they haven't learned to be honest with each other about their feelings or what they want or what they need. And also people struggle with each other in relationships because they get defensive and try to blame the other person for what's going on in the relationship rather than joining with the other person and saying, okay, let's both claim responsibility for bringing this issue up and let's see if we can figure out a way to solve it. But people go back and forth blaming each other and sometimes we'll do that for 20, 30, 40 years without ever getting through to the root of the issue. I've actually had people in my office <clears throat> that have been, that have described a problem to me in the first hour I met with them. And I asked them, how long have you been fighting about this? And in one case, I remember vividly, they said 29 years. Oh my gosh. Wow. And so they've been fighting for the close to three decades and basically the entire length of their marriage this same issue had come up over and over again and had never been resolved. And so to me, that's just astounding because, you know, almost nobody would put up with driving a car that broke down every few days. Yeah. You know, and or a flat tire for would, 30 years. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Uh, most of us wouldn't have a friend for 30 years that was always yelling and screaming at mm, us. Not <laughs> and so, yeah. But the things we do in, in love are completely in a different mystical category. But the, the same rules apply because human beings 
thrive on honesty and they thrive mm. on taking personal responsibility and creating personal responsibility for things in their lives. And people thrive on appreciating themselves and each other. And when we don't do those things, we get the predictable results. Things fall apart. And so in the book, especially in The Joy of Genius, I ask people to make a commitment to opening up to their individual genius, to their unique mm -hmm. abilities. And I ask them to make a formal commitment to that, to actually seal a deal with themselves and all, if all you need to do is make that commitment and then spend 10 minutes a day, we, we start here with having people spend 10 minutes a day and pencil it into your schedule where you're going to focus exclusively on your genius. If you don't know your genius, you just go in a room for 10 minutes and ask yourself, hmm, what is my genius? But the, the act of opening up and declaring a commitment to bringing forth your genius works real practical miracles in your life. Yeah. I, uh, I, I want to go back to something, uh, and you, you must have read my mind, Gay, because I wanted to talk to you about something in the book that I've actually, you know, I grew up in alcoholic background and all the story, you know, typical Irish stuff. And uh, one of the things that I learned to do very early on was to lie. Like, I would lie about everything. And it wasn't until uh, till age 30 that somebody was brave enough to call me out that I was lying to their face. Uh -huh. You know, actually earlier than that, it was about 25 when I was living in Germany. And it really, it kind of woke me up. And I, and I, and I, and I, I started to think about, boy, wh where else am I lying in my life? Now, fast forward to last week when I was listening to this talk. Uh, I, do you know a guy by the name of Adyashanti? Uh, no, I don't think Zen, I do. Yeah, Zen, Zen monk, Buddhist teacher. He's, he's a very nice lad. And uh, he was talking about speaking honestly. And so I would really, like just telling the truth, you know, I I, uh, I found myself gay. Uh, this is, I, I have to be honest here. Uh, my girlfriend cooked this beautiful lunch for me with vegetables and, and, and different things. And I wasn't hungry. So I only ate half of it. But I didn't want to tell her that I didn't eat the whole thing. So I was walking downstairs with with, with the uh, the half bowl of vegetables. I was going to hide it, put it in the compost, and say nothing to no one. You know, when she came home and said, oh, it was wonderful. Yeah, thanks very much, sweetie. It was beautiful. <laughs> and, I just, and I caught myself walking down the stairs, hiding the lie, you know, getting ready to hide the lie. And, and then I opened up your book, and in the middle of your book, you start talking about speaking honestly. And, and boy, I, I have to say that that really hit me because it's so easy to spread a little lie dust on anything, you know, <laughs> on everything that we do. And I caught myself in that moment. Talk to me about one of the things I love in all your books, Gay, is that you're very honest about your experience you know, with your relationship experiences. And I think reading them, I said, God, would I be so honest now to put that in a book? Uh, why, are, why is it you're so honest in books? And what is it you want people to hear about, about speaking honestly, Gay? Well, one of the things that I've discovered that anything that I can be honest about ceases to be an issue. Hmm. You know, it ceases to be any kind of problem. Yeah. And if I can learn to speak honestly about my faults and flaws, well, I can also speak honestly about my achievements and my loves and, you know, the passions of my life. But I think we need to be completely transparent to the world. I always tell my students in our seminars that if there's something in your life that you're not willing to stand up in the middle of a crowded football stadium and talk about to 60,000 people over the microphone, that issue has a grip on you. Hmm. The moment you become transparent to it, real miracles begin to happen. I have lots of examples of that because I have, you know, in, in working with 20,000 people or so over the last 40 or 50 years, I've really learned that there's, you know, problems really are universal, that a person in Alaska may have exactly the same issue as a person in um you know, South Africa or a person in Borneo. And so the 
the fundamentals are often always the same. And, and if you look at great movies or great plays, the issue is always the same, that somebody is out of integrity about something, something they've said that's not true or something they've done that they're trying to conceal or something that they want to do that they are afraid to talk about. And then life closes in on them until they're forced to either drop the lie and come out into the open about it or contract and keep contracting more and more and more. And so that way lays tragedy, you know, that that I see a lot of people doing that. There's a wonderful quotation I use in the book from the apocryphal Gospel of Thomas, which says that if you bring forth what is within you, Mm -hmm. what is within you will save you. But if you don't bring forth what is within you, what is within you will destroy you. And I found that to be absolutely practically true in working with people, that if we don't bring forth our potential, if we don't make our life about opening up to who we really are and what our greatest contribution can be, if we don't do that, then we begin to wither away inside. And I think that those things begin to really eat at us that we haven't fully expressed and opened up to. And so I think that uh, all of us are on a journey, and the journey is trying to reveal our genius, to bring ourselves forth in our full glory and flower. And then if we don't do that, then we don't feel good inside. Yeah, I mean, our, our genius, in a way, is our truth. Would that be fair to say, Gay? Yes, I think that's definitely... Uh, an aspect of the truth is our genius, that you can't get to your genius without the truth, yeah. without being absolutely honest with yourself and being honest with the people around you. You can't find out who you truly are and what your genius is because you're busy defending yourself all the time. And there goes all of your energy. Yeah, I, uh, no, no, Gay, I, 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 I what I talk, what I heard, like, about speaking honestly, the the thing that flashed into my into my brain, and I, and I, I'm probably going to put you on the spot here, but if your wife came home and she bought a dress, and 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 she put it on and said, "What do you think, Gay?" and let's say that you were like, "Oh, this is you know, this is not really, you know, I'm not really into it." How would you speak your truth about that? Because we're not talking about an emotional dump on people. No, no, absolutely. There's there's a difference between honesty and bluntness where yeah. you really are, mm-hmm. are, don't care about the other person's feelings. You know, well, here's the way. Um, in fact, let me give you a real life example. Yeah. <laughs> uh, see, we've been together now. We just celebrated our 37th wedding anniversary. Mm. So we've been together quite a long time. When we got together back in 1980, we were both in our 30s, and we had a lot of learning to do. <laughs> and so uh, Katie one time came and asked me, she said that she was on a diet, and she wanted to get rid of clothes that made her look fat. And so uh, she asked me to tell her if I if she was wearing something that made her look fat, would I bring it to her attention? Mm-hmm. And I was a little bit reluctant to take on this task. <laughs> yes, that's, kind of yeah, that's a big me. one. <laughs> but but I, I agreed to do it. And, oh, my uh, gosh. One morning, uh, this was about maybe a year into our relationship, we were going off. Uh, oh, by the way, w- we got together and we started working together almost the same summer that we got together. And so we've been working together and living together now for uh, coming up on 40 years here in another year or so. And so um, we... Uh, we were going off to give a talk one morning at a church in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And she was wearing one of those dresses that, in my opinion, made her look fat. <laughs> and so <laughs> I said, God. now, I don't recommend doing it this way. This is the wrong way. Yeah, to do don't it. try said, this at home, listeners. <laughs> yeah, because as we were going out the door, see, yeah. I picked the wrong time. I said, mm, yeah. you know, that's probably one of those dresses that make you look a little bit fat. <laughs> <And> she, <laughs> I don't know if there's a right time for that, Gay. Well, I, I can tell you that there's a wrong time. And yeah, yeah, wrong okay, time. yeah. But uh, so w- when you take on a job like that, you need to be mindful of the timing. Uh, yeah. But but now I think after 37 married years and almost 40 years together, we've learned to be connoisseurs of the truth. So I think now if I said something mm-hmm. like that, she would say, oh, thank you for letting me know, you know, because we've had decades of being honest with each other so we know that we're not attacking each other 
when we're being honest with yeah. each other. But now, would would you would, would you say the same? Knowing what you know now, and going back to that moment, would you say anything differently? I'd probably time it a little bit differently, and I would say I, I would say something up front. I would say, Katie, are you still um, interested in learning about dresses that make you look fat? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and get permission to everything. Said, yeah, permission. Then yeah. if she said yes, I'd say, well, I think that's one of them. So I might be a little more tactful in yeah. my way of doing it. Yeah, yeah, because there's 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 truth, and then there's bluntness. You know, as you as you already mentioned. All right, very beautiful. Uh, Gay, we're going to take a quick little um, station ID. You might want to take your uh, your uh, ear away from the phone because I'm just going to play a little bit of. Uh, happy-go-lucky Irish music. And when we come back, Gay, I'd love to talk about... um, In the book, you have this chapter called uh, How to Woo Your True Creativity. And uh, that might have been my favorite chapter in the book. So I'd love for us to, uh, to talk about that when you come back. So stay tuned. All right. Welcome, all you dear listeners out there. You're listening to the Celtic Coach Radio Show, where science, spirituality, and self-discovery meet on KOWS.FM. F for Frank, M4. That's the only... Spe- that... <laughs> Okay. Special effects not included. All right. Uh, we, uh, you're listening on KOWS.FM. If you're out there in your car, uh, keep your windows rolled up at 92.5 FM on the dial. Celtic Coach Radio Show every Friday on KOWS.FM. And uh, if you want to know more, you can go to the CelticCoach.com. And if you want to hear about our, our l- speaker today, our guest today, you can go to Gay Hendricks. Dot com. All right, we're talking about his new book, and it's a lovely new book, uh, called The Joy of Genius. Dr. Gay Hendricks is in the house. He's a leader in the field of relationship transformation, body therapies. He's been in the game for over 45 years after earning his Ph.D. in counseling psychology from Stanford. Gay served as professor of counseling psychology at the University of Colorado. 21 years there and over 40 books. He's still going strong. Uh, Gay, welcome back. Thank you very much, Dermot. It's great to be with you. All right. So, Gay, tell me about this uh, this chapter in the book. Uh, it it kind of sounds like I'm I'm taking creativity out on a date. Uh, how to woo your true creativity? Now, is there flowers, chocolate, wine, anything like that involved in this in this scenario? Uh, no, it's more like uh, well, if you think about how you would woo a beloved. The first thing you, you wouldn't you wouldn't start off with candy or alcohol or diamond rings or anything like that. It would first have to start in your heart that you actually did appreciate and value this person and you want to be closer to them. And so when you're wooing your own creativity, you need to do the same thing first with yourself is to make inside yourself a safe space for creativity. So you need to let go of that critical mind that's always yeah, 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 on us. And in the book, I talk a lot about the importance of letting go of negative thinking, because for most of us, we go around kind of pecking on ourselves all the time and picking on ourselves with negative thinking and to the point where we squelch our own natural, joyful creativity by being far too judgmental with it. And so it's important to be friendly and open-hearted with your own creativity, just like to be a friend to somebody, you need to be open-hearted to your friend. And so you want to woo your creativity in that way first, by making a space in your heart for it, and also then being willing to act on it. You know, if if you want to be friends with somebody, You can't just be a friend to them in your heart. You have to call them on the phone or talk to them on the phone or go out for a walk Mm -hmm. with them. Or, you know, you need to spend quality time 
And so the same token, we need to spend quality time with our own genius every day. I recommend first in the book, I start people with just 10 minutes a day, because I know that if they do that 10 minutes a day for a week, it's going to become contagious, and pretty soon they're going to want to do 20 or 30 minutes in their genius. Pretty soon they'll be doing their whole day in their genius. When I started off, Dermot, I this was goes back you know 35 years or so ago, when I first started asking myself, hmm, am I really doing what I most love to do? And hmm, am I really doing what my real genius is? I realized that I was only spending about 10% of my time doing the things that I really love to do. And the rest of my time, I was employing my creativity, doing things that necessarily I didn't want to do, but I was working for someone else. And so I started thinking, how can I open up to my own unique genius? And I started wondering about that. And gradually, I started to spend more and more of my time. So I set the goal of spending half my time in my zone of genius, in my, in my genius. And it took me a few years to get there. But then once I got there, I started thinking, okay, maybe 70% of my time. And so it took me a few more years to get there. But now for the last 20 years or so, I spend 90% of my time doing what's in my genius area, what I call now the genius spiral. I'm on the genius spiral 90% of my time. And the other 10%, I'm getting around from place to place or like I say in the in the book, I'm uh, I'm not necessarily a genius at unloading the dishwater uh, dishwasher, or yeah. I'm not a genius at uh, <laughs> washing them, taking taking out the kitty litter, or anything yeah. like that. But I do it just because it makes for a better environment. Yeah. Now, now, Gay, why why is it important for you to spend so much time on your creativity? Why, why are you inviting people to do that? Because I know deep in my heart that. I am never going to be satisfied unless I'm bringing forth as much as I possibly can Mm -hmm. of my own essence, of my own creativity. Mm -hmm. And I've, you know, working now with, I've worked a lot back, especially during the 80s and the 90s, uh, doing a lot of corporate consulting with executives and firms around the world. And there were people who were really, really smart and really working at the highest level, but often their complaint was that they weren't having any chance to access their true genius inside. And so in my work with them, I always started with finding out if they would be willing at least to dedicate 10 minutes of calendar time to opening up to their genius every day. Hmm. And you'd be surprised at how many busy executives would say, oh, no, I don't have 10 more minutes I can do. But once they did it, penciled it into their calendar and started spending that 10 minutes a day on their genius, pretty soon it grew to 20 minutes. Pretty soon it grew to 30 minutes. And every time you open up to another minute you're spending every day in your genius and doing what you most love to do, that builds a kind of satisfaction in life and a kind of confidence in life that you can't get any other way. Yeah. Now, now paint the picture here, Gay, because I'm going to be the advocate for the listeners, and and I hear some listeners. So what we're talking about is 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 it, it, just to in case anyone's jumped in here, the joy of genius. We're talking with Dr. Gay Hendricks, and we're talking about how to woo your true creativity, which is also you know making space for your creativity. So now, kind of paint the picture here, Gay. Like, okay, somebody's listening on 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 the radio here, and they hear they hear you say, okay. Uh, Pencil in 10 minutes for creativity. So they pencil it in. They're sitting down wherever they're sitting. You don't need to have a creative space. You are creativity itself. Um, so and, the, and then they say, okay, so what now? <laughs> okay, well, what now is begin with, well, let's say that person doesn't really know what their genius yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. The, the first thing to do, I talk about this a lot in the book, but let me just give you the real quick secret here. Hmm. You need to go in a room for 10 minutes and simply sit there and wonder. And here's how wonder goes. Just let me tell you a wonder thought. Hmm, what is my genius? Or, hmm, what do I really love most to do in my work? So notice that it starts with a hmm, a moment of genuine wonder. And wonder is the ticket. 
the moment you can invoke wonder, if you can actually get into that state of consciousness of genuinely wondering about something, it is one of the most powerful tools you'll ever discover. The, the power of wonder is I can never get enough of talking about this and focusing on it because if you think about it, wonder is the exact opposite of fear. It's at the other end of the emotional spectrum. Fear is being very contracted and your muscles are tight and you're looking around to see what the issue is and um, you're trying to figure out how to solve a problem that you don't know how to solve. And so that's at one end of the emotional continuum. But imagine that the other end is a real open-hearted space called wonder where you, hmm, you're actually inquiring. You're actually inquiring with genuine curiosity into something. So most people in relationships get themselves in trouble by digging themselves in and becoming defensive. And that is grown out of fear that the more defensive you get, the more scared you get, and then the more it looks like everybody's out to get you and the more scared you get. And so, and underneath that, a lot of the anger that people have in relationships is that feeling of fear of being trapped, of not knowing the solution to whatever the problem is. And so what we need to do is get a much more open-hearted stance toward ourselves of being really willing to let go of what isn't working and open up to finding new solutions. And the gateway of wonder is really the quick way to get there. Yeah, and and, and now when I hear you say wonder, like for me, I hear ponder, I hear wonder. I, I don't hear it as a thinking thing. Like this is not a thinking exercise, right? Connecting to your genius or expressing your genius. No, it it's, goes deeper than that. Mm. Of course, part of it is the mind, because you, you might say in your mind, hmm, what is my genius? That's mm. a genuine mental thought. But to get to wonder, you have to involve your whole body. Because if you think of, let's say, standing on a mountaintop looking out over the Grand Canyon or, or looking up at the night sky and seeing the millions of stars there – that kind of wonder is a whole body experience. It's not just a mental thing. So what we need to do is link up our minds and our bodies because the mind without our body is, is, doesn't have any real power and juice to it. And our bodies without our minds just keep bumbling around. So what we need to do, of course, is put them both in harmony working with each other so that you come at life from a place of wholeness rather than being divided in half, mind and body. Mm. What, do you, what do you say, Gay, to the people who are listening that, that might say, oh, I'm not creative and I don't have any genius? Yes, well, that's probably the number one thing that I encounter when I go around the world talking mm. about this, is people say, well, I'm not a really creative person, and I, I haven't met a person yet who wasn't creative. Because if you think about it, creativity is what got humans here in the first place. Yeah. You know, way back 50 million years ago when we came up out of the oceans and tried, you know, our, our whale friends tried it up on land apparently uh, 50 million years ago or so, and they didn't like it and went back to the ocean. And I don't know if maybe they made the right decision, but we're <laughs> up here on land now and we've come a long way from that. And so um, I think that now our job is to make the most of our human experiment. And our human experiment has taken us through all sorts of changes over the past thousands and millions of years. You know, just a few thousand years ago, we were all hunter-gatherers. It wasn't until 10,000 years or so ago people got figured out this thing like planting corn and beans and staying in one place and tending crops and things like that. Before then, we were all nomads cruising around looking for tonight's meal somewhere. And so we, we were on the move all the time in a hunter-gatherer mode. And so now we've come a long way in the past 10,000 years to where we've evolved to a point now where most of us don't even have to grow our own vegetables anymore. Yeah. Whereas in my granddad's time, most people lived on farms. Now, only, I think, back in my granddad's time, 5% of people lived in cities and 95% of people lived in on farms. And now... The other way around, almost nobody lives on farms, 5% or something like that, and everybody else lives in 
medium or large cities. And so we've changed tremendously over the past 100 years or so. And not only that, we've evolved now to the point where we talk to each other by muttering into our hands. You know, we walk along the street muttering into our hands and talking to somebody on the other side of the world. And so it's no matter how much we've evolved, though, and how much technology we have, it all boils down to the same kind of fundamentals that everybody knows in their heart is what makes relationships really work. And it's it's got to be grounded in a place of integrity and honesty and, and taking responsibility for yourself. The moment you slip out of those fundamental principles, things begin to wobble and then life begins to give us more and more feedback that we're on the wrong track. Mm. What, um, Gay? Uh, uh, this is slightly off topic, but 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 it's come into my head. I'd love to love to ask you it. Um, how do you feel, Gay? As you look out into the world, how do you feel about uh, how do you feel about our future? Are, are you hopeful? Oh well, I I would say that I'm. Um, I'm a combination of realist and optimist Mm -hmm. that I like to look, you know, like um, Mohammed said, trust in Allah, but tie your camel first. Yeah. Yeah, And uh, so I'm, I'm a big Uh believer in being open to the cosmos, cosmos and taking a good look at what's available right here in the moment and taking care of ourselves right here in the moment. And so I, I think the way I see the world is we're, getting better and worse all at the same time. But the fact that we're getting better is so much more compelling than how we're getting worse. We see people perpetuating the same old mistakes over and over and over again, and as they've been doing for thousands of years. But look at what people are doing on the positive side right now. For example, you know, that that the whole world is not at war anymore. It's been 50 or 60 years now since there's been a major world war. And that's a great thing to celebrate. By the same token, you know, that that if you counted up all the population of the world, all however many 7 billion of us there are, you'd find that in actual fact, 98% of us live in peace. There are small pockets of conflict all over the place, 20 or 30 usually at any given time Mm -hmm. in the world, maybe more. But at one point I counted up, I think there was 35 conflicts going on in the world, you know, wars, civil wars, that kind of thing. Uh, 25 or so of the 35 were about religion, and 10 or so, uh, some of them were about other things like oil and water rights and things like that. But a lot of the conflicts that humans have are simply mental divisions that we artificially create. Like there's no difference between the way a Christian's mind works, the actual brain, and a Buddhist's mind works, or a Muslim's mind works, that we've all got the same territory in there that we need to uh, learn how to use. And so I think I'm very hopeful in regard to the future of us because I see people doing such breakthrough Wow things. I was recently giving a talk in uh, um, Santa Fe, New Mexico. My wife and I were down there. Katie and I went down to speak in a uh, thing that was televised for PBS that will be shown later on this winter. And I was noticing while I was there that almost everybody in the world is living in peace. That I did a calculation and I realized that here we are, we're so concerned with conflict that Mm. we don't just celebrate for a little while. Why why don't we celebrate that we are at peace largely in the world? And so I want us to put as much attention, more attention on the positive things that are going on than facing the realities. I think we need to face the realities of what goes on in the world, but really focus on the positive contributions that people can make. Like one of my mentors, Buckminster Fuller, said 40 years ago that there was easily plenty of enough natural resources on the planet to make everyone not just a millionaire, but a billionaire, if we learned how to use it properly. And so uh, I think that that's what I want to keep my focus on, is how many positive things we can do when we really open up and tap into our genius. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you, Gay. Uh, and you've made quite a dent yourself, Gay, for the last 40, 45 years in terms of, of, of positive contribution. So uh, uh, thank you. Um, I'll, uh, and thanks for that answer, Gay. I, I really appreciated that. Um, I, I struggle with it myself at times. You know, I get down and, you know, oh, is it, is it, is it worth it? But, you know, the thing about it is is that creativity, there's no... There's no end to how creative our our genius can be. And, and and that alone for me is hopeful. You know, that that any problem, I don't care what it is. I've I've seen it in a in a micro level in my own life where every problem that I've ever had, there's there's come a solution. You know, and so I, I look out into the world and I and I and I, I see that I see that on a global happening on a global scale too, you know, or at least I, I, uh, that's my intention. Um, yeah, you're talking about in the book here, what have we got? Oh, we've got about eight minutes, so we're looking good. You talk about, I love this line, creativity thrives in an atmosphere of lavish, lavish appreciation. Would you, would you, <laughs> yeah. would you share a little bit about that quote? It's, it's very nice. Yes, well, if you think about it, um, all of us really thrive in an atmosphere of lavish appreciation, especially when we can appreciate ourselves for who we are and what we're doing. But the reason I say that is because I find that we go around often with so much negative thinking that we need to go to the opposite extreme and learn how to lavishly appreciate the things that we do mm. rather than constantly criticizing the things we do. Right. I, I was once a, a friend of mine and uh, called me one time in an absolute anxiety attack, and the trigger for the anxiety attack was he was going to L.A. the next day to have his star put on the, you know, the famous Hollywood <laughs> yeah. Walk of Fame there. Yeah. And up the day before, up comes this anxiety attack about, I can't do it. I, I can't go down there and do it. You know, I'm not going to go. I've decided not to go. I'm going to have somebody go for me. <laughs> Wait a minute, man. You can't do that. You've got to show up at your own star. And what is it about it that's bothering you? Well, it, it was driving to his issue, uh, driving, driving to the surface all the issues about unworthiness mm -hmm. that he had carried around for so long. And so here was finally an acknowledgment of his greatness and yet he carried around this old kernel of negativity in himself. And so standing on our balcony that afternoon, we, we just stood there for a long time while I was talking to him. And I was having him breathe into that feeling of unworthiness, that little kernel or knot of unworthiness down there. And having him love that, just loving that, just loving that part of himself. And I think that if we can learn to love that most contracted, distilled little bit of ourselves that doesn't feel like we're worthwhile, that opens up then and we begin to flood ourselves with creative ideas. It's like a celebration goes off when we learn to love the things that in the past we felt most unlovable toward. Mm, mm, I like that. Last two questions, Gay. First one, um... Let's say you were to get an email. You you come downstairs to that office. I think you start about 6 a.m. in the morning, and you have your favorite beverage, and you sit down to the computer, and uh, your book is out on the shelves, The Joy of Genius, out on the shelves. And um, you open up your email, and you get an email from someone who's read your book, and it's 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 touched them. What would you what would you like to hear in that email? Oh well, thank you. What a wonderful question. Well, I I feel like I live a very blessed life because almost every day I get those kind of emails, and mm. uh, I am blessed with lots of you know thousands of reviews on Amazon and other places of people who have said their lives have been changed. So that's the most important thing when I when a person comes up to me on the street and says. Thank you so much for writing Conscious Loving or The Big Leap. It changed my life. Mm -hmm. And I love that because the material that I'm writing about changed my life. And so if I find something that's changed my life, I want to share it with the world. And then the um, 
the chain goes on. I've met people, bless their hearts, who have given away, you know, like 50, 100, 200 sometimes copies of of The Big Leap. And um, I gave a talk to a group of people a while back that they'd uh, had all 800 of their members read The Big Leap. And so I came in and gave them a talk afterwards. And that's wonderful to be speaking into that kind of resonance, you know, that that because uh, I've also had the exact opposite experience of going to places to, to give a talk where I was being maybe paid a lot of money to give the talk, but the people really didn't want to hear what I had to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's always a, a no fun situation. Uh, yeah. But uh, most of the time, I, I like to hear from people that they've used the books and it's it's practically changed their life in some kind of way. Yeah. So 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 what what you're saying, Gay, is that sharing creativity and your genius has the byproduct of making others happy. Definitely. That's yeah. that's the way it is. All right. I like it. All right. Uh, now I want to. I, I think I misspoke earlier. I said GayHendrix dot com, but it's actually your website is Hendrix dot com. Is that right? Yes, h e n d r i c k s dot com, and uh, people can go there, and that's a good jumping off place to all of our other activities that we do. Beautiful. Now, Gay, I have a selfish question. I uh, I, I have the honor of training and teaching a lot of life coaches online. I'm a, I'm a teacher of life coaches, and you have done. You've been a coach yourself for over forty five years, so I'm wondering. If you could share with the coaches out there, there's quite a lot of them listening in today, uh, life coaches. Uh, if you could share, you know, one or two things that, you know, what would be one or two qualities that would make for a great coach? Oh, great experience? question. Yeah. Um, well, as it happens, I'm just here sitting in my uh, home office as we talk, and I'm looking across the desk at a little silicon band that a uh, little orange silicon band that we give to people at the end of some of our trainings and on the band it has hendrix.com on it but it also says breathe move love and so if you if you take those basics breathing what most of us do when we have a problem is we stop breathing we we clutch up about it but if you'll just take some big easy breaths around whatever it is that helps open up your body and then move move your body around let yourself explore yourself when you open up to feelings and then ultimately love breathe move love ultimately love as much as you can from wherever you happen to be if it's something that you need to love in yourself it'll pester you until you stop for 10 seconds and just love it the way it is. And if there's something about another person that you're close to that you haven't learned to love yet, that issue will just keep coming up and up and up until you can embrace that whole just as it is. And so to me, um, what's on this little wristband, breathe, move, love, is a key for any coach because in any situation, you can always find a solution by one of those three pathways. Mm, thank you, Kay. I appreciate, appreciate that. Okay, so The Joy of Genius. When, when is this out on the bookshelves, Gay? Oh, oh it's out there now. It, it um, is, okay. It, it came out a couple of weeks ago, um, yeah, at the end of uh, September, and so it's uh, out there doing its thing in the world, and um, uh, lots of people are buying the uh, digital version, and lots of people are buying the audio version. I did the audio version myself, so it's in my own voice, and people are really enjoying that. I got a lot of letters about that. And uh, so, um, yeah, um, thank you for spreading the message, and uh, and be sure and get your 10 minutes of genius in today, sir. Absolutely. So www.hendricks, H-E-N-D-R-I-C-K-S dot com. Dr. Uh, Gay Hendricks, The Joy of Genius. Uh, Gay, uh, uh, on a personal note, thank you very much. I know you're a very busy man, and I really appreciate you uh, spending an hour with us today. And I wish you all the best. And I hope at some point, Gay, to uh, to meet you in person. Well, come down my way, and uh, wh what part of the world do you live in? I'm not. I'm up the road. I'm in uh, Sebastopol, California, next to Santa Rosa. Oh yes, I love Sebastopol. I was just there this summer for a wedding. Not uh, not too far from you at all. All the best to you, Gay, and we'll, we'll we'll talk to you again. Cheers. Thanks a lot, Dermot. Bye now. Bye now.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, you heard it from the man himself. Um, if you want to hear more or you want to read the book, you can go to uh, Hendrix.com. You can go to Amazon. Any of those places will have, will have the book called The Joy of Genius. Uh, really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed the book. I'm going to read it a few more times because it's one of those books you got, you got to read a few times and then you know spend 10 minutes or so doing the hands-on uh, practices. All right, uh, you've been listening to the Celtic Coach Radio Show where science, spirituality, and self-discovery meet. If you want to hear more about me, if you want to uh, look into coaching, you can go to The Celtic Coach, C-E-L-T-I-C, theCelticCoach.com. And uh, feel free to uh, to give me a jingle if you're interested in life coaching or you want to talk about something that's going on. Feel free to do that. The door is open. All right, everyone. Uh, we're going to leave out of here. If you're listening on YouTube or SoundCloud or iTunes or any of those, uh, we're going to finish the show now. But if you're listening live on the radio, we're going to keep going for another 30 minutes with some extra music. But let's, of course, let's leave you out with a little bit of the old Irish jingle. Cheers, everyone. Cheers.